So today, um, we have Elder Peter Gui uh, speaking to us, and he's going to continue on the book of Philippians. Okay, so I'm going to turn the time over to him. Let's welcome him, and I'm going to move the things over a little bit. Okay, sure. All right, thank you, Pastor Casey. Thank you for the announcements, Elder Jerry. It's always an honor and a privilege uh, to speak to all of you. So I'm really shifting over. Uh, really glad uh, to be up here with you today. So how many of you guys, you know, guys know what a stress ball is, right? This is usually kind of a squishy ball, usually it might have a design on it, maybe a logo, maybe an emoji face on it. And I'm really bummed because I actually had some that I was going to bring with me to show, which I put them in the wrong bag, so I don't have them with me. But how many of you feel like you could probably use a stress ball right about now? Maybe a stress ball? Okay. Uh, without getting into specific Zoe, what, what might be one, one reason why you want a stress ball right now? You have stress. Okay. Anyone else? One other person to throw around? Okay, very good. Thank you. So I could use a stress ball right now. What, I like stress balls not because they're good for squeezing, but at work we like to actually throw them at each other, which is how we kind of reduce stress. But because we got moved next to HR, we kind of had to stop that a little bit. But the last few weeks have been really, really stressful for me. And for those who, uh, the guys that come out to men's night on Wednesday night, uh, especially last Wednesday, you know what's been going on in my life and why I have a lot of stress going on. So speaking of work, uh, there were a lot of things going on. I got relocated from Irvine to Fountain Valley. I had multiple people leave my team, and my schedule was just filled with interviewing people and interviews not going very well. And when you have fewer people, it means you have more work, uh, more load to take care of. On top of that, now my team just moved back to Irvine, and so I'm kind of by myself. I get to stay in Fountain Valley. And one of the reasons why I'm in Fountain Valley is because we already sold our house uh, in Tustin. So we're no longer near Irvine uh, because we thought we were going to stay in Fountain Valley. And we're staying in Fountain Valley with my parents. So you can imagine just the extra stress of being back at home and just the stress kind of feeds off of, of one another. Uh, and then we're looking for a house. We're trying to buy a house. So that adds a lot of stress. And then more recently, my dad kind of got forced into retirement before he was ready for retirement. And so my parents are dealing with stress. And when you're around people who are stressed, you get stressed too. And so being, uh, being their only son, I'm working on trying to get things settled for them. Uh, my dad no longer had a cell phone because he had a cell phone with work. And now I'm, I'm helping him getting things set up and helping him to uh, get his own email address and getting that set up and finding things for him to do during the day because now he's, he's bored out of his mind. Uh, the other day I was walking by and he was just watching cat videos on YouTube, uh, which is a really, really bad sign if that's what my dad is doing to spend and pass the time. So all that's been going on and I knew that I'm coming up here to speak today and speak about uh, a very important topic, which is the topic of stress. And stress is not good. Um, so according to the Mayo Clinic, uh, there are a lot of effects of stress. Uh, just on your body, uh, you can have all these things. And honestly, I don't want any of those. And not just your body, it affects your mood, which you have a number of effects up there. And then not just internally, but externally as well, your behavior, your mood and your behavior affect other people. Remember I just mentioned that uh, my parents are stressed, I'm getting stressed. And if I'm getting stressed, I'm adding to my parents' stress as well. So today, uh, our topic is how to keep from stressing out. And we're continuing on with the Habits of Happiness series. We're actually on part eight of nine, so we're almost there, we're almost to the end. And we have the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Philippians, and we're going to be going through chapter four, verses six to 13. And these are very important because these verses actually teach us how not to stress out. An important part of it is verse 7. If you guys have your handouts, go ahead and 
Get those handouts ready. If you don't have a pen, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll let uh, the ushers hand out pens. Let's see if your hands are already up. But let me go ahead and read verse 7 for you. Uh, because verse 7 is a very important promise. It says, if you do this, you will experience God's peace which is far more wonderful than a human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. So this promise is talking about what we call a peace that passes understanding. A peace that passes understanding. Uh, What do I mean by that? So just imagine total chaos, total stress. For me, seeing something like this with all those toolbars up there, that is just, that browser is just stress for me, especially as someone who works in IT. And imagine just chaos, everything going wrong in your life, kind of like what I was mentioning earlier, uh, what's going on with me and my life and my family. Despite all that, having an inexplicable peace. So in other words, peace in the midst of problems. And verse 7 in the NASB translation, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I like this this translation as well because it tells us that this peace doesn't just get rid of our problems. Because our problems will still be there. Uh, A lot of the sources of stress that we have are not necessarily internal. But we get stress from our parents, our kids, our spouses, work, um, school, tests, SATs, college. And those things are out of our control. We can't just simply get rid of all those things, get rid of all those stressors. So this peace that God is offering is like a shield. It's a shield that covers us and protects us. It guards our hearts. It guards our minds. Back when I was in high school, before I was even a Christian, I was attending the Christian club. And one of the first early songs that I'd learned, and it stuck with me, uh, I'd learned, uh, I could sing of your love forever, which we sing forever. But there's another song. It was really simple. It was called, well, let me just, I'm not going to sing it, but it says, Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. And you just repeat hallelujah over and over again. God is Shield. You probably heard of uh, wearing the armor of God. It's it's continuing on with that idea. Now, here's the thing about this promise. How many of you guys want that promise? Who who wants like peace, even with all the stress in your life? All right, you should probably see all hands up. We don't like stress. Stress is bad. But here's the thing: this promise comes with a premise. In other words, it comes with a condition. Uh, there are five things that you have to do uh, according to the passage that we're going through today in order to get this peace. So you want to pay attention. If you want to deal with your stress, you want to pay attention to these five things. Uh, Before we jump into those, uh, will you join me in prayer? Father God, we just thank you just for this opportunity, uh, just to dive into your word, to hear the things that the Apostle Paul has to say, uh, the things that your son Jesus Christ had to say. I pray that our hearts, our minds, Uh, in your ears, just be open to you. And may we realize that regardless of the amount of stress we came into service today with, that we leave with an understanding that we can just leave it all to you, that you can handle it. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so five things. Let me go over the first one. It is in you know, write it on your handouts, is refuse to worry about anything. Refuse to worry about anything. Now, very important, just so you guys know, even though there are five things, I'm going to spend the most amount of time on number one. So don't get worried if we're still on number one, like halfway through um, the sermon. I'm not running out of time, I hope. So Philippians 4, uh, verse 6 says, never worry about anything. So, Never means never, like not ever, like no exceptions. This idea of refusing to worry, never worrying, uh, was 
very important to Jesus as well. So on his Sermon on the Mount, he dedicates a good portion of that sermon to talk about refusing to worry, never worrying. So from that, from those verses of a Sermon on the Mount, uh, we learn four reasons why we should not worry. So I'm going to go over those with you, and they're on your handout as well. First is that worry is unreasonable. You write that down. Worry is unreasonable. Jesus said in Matthew 6.25, Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Here's the thing about worry. Worry exaggerates problems. I mean, you may have started with a problem that looks like this, but think about it. When's the last time you worried about something and it actually made your problem smaller? If anything, it makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. Can you imagine for those who are married or in a relationship and you have an argument and you're upset with your spouse about something, and the more you think about it, it just gets worse and worse and bigger and bigger, doesn't it? The more you stew on it, it's just, ah, it like builds up. Um, worry is like that as well. And on top of making it bigger, worry just doesn't work. So it's useless. It doesn't address the problems. It doesn't help make a positive impact or a positive difference in your life. How many of you have taken physics already? Like in high school, or college, engineers? Okay, I see a few hands. Uh, so I took physics in my senior year of high school. And one of the illustrations that my teacher, Mr. Larson, gave, uh, he asked this, similar to this, is imagine this really large boulder. And you spend an hour just pushing on it. I mean, you're breaking a sweat. You're drinking Gatorade just to replenish those electrolytes. Uh, maybe you take a break, eat a cliff bar, go back into it, start pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and it doesn't budge. In physics, how much work did you actually do? Someone want to give me an answer? Everyone's very hesitant. All right. I think I saw an answer kind of squeak up a little bit, and I, I did see an answer. So you did no work whatsoever in physics. So the, there are multiple formulas for work, but in physics, work at its base form is work equals force times displacement S, or distance. So you may have put in a lot of force. You burned a bunch of ATPs, you burned a bunch of energy, you were sweating, sure. But if that boulder did not move, you did zero work. Zero distance, zero change, means zero work. And that's kind of like worry. And worry is actually a little bit worse. Worry is you, you're not even putting your hands on the boulder. You're just kind of like staring at it and thinking about it. Now I'm going to move that boulder. And unless you're a Jedi, I'm sorry, that, that boulder is not going to move. That X-wing is not going to move. So worry doesn't work. Worry is unreasonable. So that's number one. Secondly, we learn from Jesus is that worry is unnatural. You write that down. Worry is unnatural. In verse 26, Jesus continues, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And I really like one of the songs, the second one that we sang earlier, said the evidence is all around. Uh, and indeed, Jesus is using illustrations of, of things in nature, and then we can learn from them. So we are not born warriors. Sure, when we were babies, we wanted something, we cried about it, but then we didn't exactly worry like the way that we worry, especially as adults or those who are, as, as we're growing up. I mean, seriously, when is the last time you saw a really little child, a young child, worry? I mean, my little girls, you know, when they want something and they ask for it, they're not thinking in the back of their minds, can daddy afford this? Did, does daddy have enough money in his bank account? Did, do we have enough money to pay our bills for the month? Did we get our tax refund yet? That's not on their minds. They're asking and they're expecting us to be able 
to provide. And so in this verse from Jesus, he's talking about birds. And birds aren't even God's children, yet he takes care of them. Um, third song we say, and it says, I am a child of God. You know, we are his children, we are his progeny. And if God so takes care of the birds, animals, mere animals that are not his children, how much more is he going to take care of us? Um, Remember that children of royalty are treated royally. Children of royalty, us, are treated royally. If we really are the child of the king of kings, then he will take care of us. And he continues on uh, in verses 28 to 29. And why worry about clothes? Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. Yet King Solomon in all his glory was never clothed as beautiful as they. So we just read that animals don't worry. Now we're hearing that plants don't worry. And you might be thinking, well, they're just plants. They don't do much other than grow and die and maybe give us fruit. But I was listening to a science podcast recently, and they've been running some experiments, and they are able to show that plants can learn. That even without a brain, they're somehow able to retain memory. We don't know how yet. They're still running experiments. They're running Pavlovian type of experiments, and they're getting results. And just plant biology is really amazing right now, uh, if you're kind of into that. So animals don't worry. Plants don't worry. But we do. And that's just not healthy. Proverbs 12, 25, the beginning part in the NIV translation, it says, anxiety weighs down the heart. In a New King James Version, it says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. I don't know about you. I don't want a bunch of stress weighing down on my heart. I don't want depression. These are not good byproducts and consequences of too much worry, of too much anxiety. And if we talk about the origin of the word of worry, in other words, it's etymology. It comes from a Middle English word called worrying, or an Old English word called worgen, not to be confused with worgen. We're not talking about werewolves and lycanthropy and all that fun stuff. Um, And it is similar to the old High German word worgen, which means to strangle. So if you imagine the word worry, you should be thinking of Bart Simpson and just getting strangled by his dad. This is what worry does. Worry chokes the life out of your life. It weighs down the heart. It can lead to depression. I don't want any of that. Now, the good news is quite the opposite. In Proverbs 14, uh, verse 30, it says that, A heart at peace gives life to the body. So having peace, God's peace, his perfect peace, a peace that passes understanding, it not just negates those negative effects of stress. Um, It actually brings about life. It actually brings about healing. It brings it to the other side. So moving on, number three is that worry is unhelpful. You can write that down. Worry is unhelpful. Jesus continues in verse 27. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? So again, worry doesn't really do anything positive for you or for me. Instead, it can be paralyzing. So for many of you who are kind of in the working world or you're familiar with either business analysis, project management, you've probably heard of the term analysis paralysis where you worry and you overthink about the same things. And you're stuck in this endless loop of possibilities. What if, what if, what if? And it's kind of like a Mobius strip where it's just, it's just going around and around and around. And you don't go anywhere. You don't get anywhere. Um, other than just wasting everyone's time in meetings. And we probably had that for those who of us work, uh, maybe in school, Unfortunately, even some church meetings can kind of do a little bit of this. 
So again, worry is like pushing a boulder. You're not really getting anywhere. And number four is worry is unnecessary. The fourth thing that Jesus teaches us about worry. It's unnecessary. In verse 30, he says, if God so cares, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he more surely care for you, O you of little faith? So flowers, they are transient. They, they come and they go, yet God thoughtfully takes care of them. So instead of, O you of little faith, instead of having little faith, how about have much faith that he will take care of you and your needs and your problems? We've been going through this series, The Habits of Happiness, and one of the, one of the points that comes up often is that happiness is a choice. Happiness is a choice. Although you may be affected by your parents, your spouse, your kids, work, school. But your happiness ultimately ends up being your choice. Similarly, worry is a choice. You can choose to hold on to all of your worry and bear all of that, or you can choose to give it, give them all to God. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Unload all your worries on God, since he is looking after you. Now, the original Greek for that word unload means just to drop, to drop it. Imagine a large thud. Um, So our worries, our burdens, we can give them to God and he can handle them. When we feel like we can't, he can in Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, it uh, says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So this is what God says that he will do. He will take your heavy burden, as heavy as it is, And he's willing to do an exchange with you. He will give you rest, his rest. He will give you a lighter burden. And he will give you his yoke instead. Now, if you're thinking yoke and you're thinking oxen pulling a plow, uh, just so you know, uh, people can have yokes to, you know, carry water and things like that. So it's not just treating you like a beast of burden. But we we can do an old switcheroo with God, and he's more than willing to do so. All right, so we made it through the first step. I said there were five. We finally made it through the first one, which is uh, refuse to worry about anything. Now, let's say you actually do that. Now you do that. Then what? Because an important thing is if you stop worrying, you're going to have to replace that with something. Now you have this gap, something you've been so used to doing that if you don't fill it with something, you might very easily go back to it. It's like when you're battling a bad habit, you're battling an addiction, and you quit cold turkey. But if you don't replace that with something, it's very easy to backslide into it. So the next four things are things that we can fill in the gap. Number two is... Talk to God about everything. Talk to God about everything. So going back to Philippians 4, uh, verse 6, it says, Never worry about anything. Instead, in every situation, let God know what you need in your prayers and your requests. So my older daughter, Evelyn, you know, when she wants something, she wants ice cream, I get her ice cream. Uh, I get her my favorite, which is thrifty ice cream. I, I grew up eating thrifty ice cream. We still have it in our freezer right now. And when she asks, like I said earlier, she assumes we can afford everything. And it's not her job to worry about where I'm going to get the money, if I have the money in my wallet. Her job is to ask. Now you, us, 
as children of God, our job is not to worry about how God will provide. Our job is to ask, and God will take care of it. And if we don't ask, how can we ever expect God to provide? My favorite book, Book of James, chapter 4, verse 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. And some people don't ask God because they think their problems are too small. They think, oh, I don't want to bother God with this thing. Eh, I could take care of it. But don't think that your problems are too small for God. Reason being, all of our problems are tiny before a giant, before an omnipotent God. Romans 8.32 says, Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he who gave us Christ also give us everything else we need? So God already took care of our biggest need, which is for us to join him in heaven, but we couldn't do it on our own. We fell. We had sin. There's no way we can pull ourselves out of that. So he sent his son to die for us, sacrificed the son so that we could be with him. Grace, that was his grace. And it wasn't just grace at one point in time. He continues to shower grace upon us, even with the remainder of our problems. There is no area of your life that God is not interested in. I remember, I don't know if people still have them, there were some license plate covers that said, you matter to God, and it was from Saddleback Church. Again, it is that concept, you matter to God. God cares even about your little, tiny problems. He wants you to bring them to him. Number three is thank God in all things. Thank God in all things. Now, it doesn't say thank God for all things. Those are two different concepts. Because there are plenty of things that are evil, that are painful, things that you can think of in our current events, things that, why would anyone ever be thankful for those things? But rather, what this is saying is even in the bad times, you can find something good. And you've probably heard the phrase, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. It's that concept. Continuing on with Philippians 4, it says, when you ask God for what you need, also thank him for all he's done. So in this series, we've learned that gratitude and happiness are connected. They are related. You cannot be happy and ungrateful at the same time. They just don't mix. It's like oil and water. It, just, it doesn't happen. An important thing about gratitude is that it gets our eyes off of ourselves and our misery and what we're going through and our problems, and it focuses our attention on others and how we can help them and on their happiness um, as we help them as great things are happening in their lives, uh, things that God is doing in their lives. First Thessalonians 5.18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So it doesn't say in some things. It says give thanks in everything. And then if you also find yourself asking, well, what's God's will for me? What's God's will in my life? It's right there. In everything, give thanks. Now, I want to actually take it a little bit further, not just focus on verse 18, but let's expand it out the entire sentence, the entire thought. So 1 Thessalonians 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, and each of those are a single verse. So you want to memorize verses and keep them in your heart. Those are two very easy verses to, to hold in your heart. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So we're talking about the habits of happiness, the rejoice always. And number two, we just talked about uh, talking to God or praying continually. And right now, in number three, we're talking about giving thanks. So this verse really. Verses 
really encapsulates uh, these ideas that we're talking about right now. Number four is think about good things. Think about good things. So I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of stressors outside of our body. But that doesn't mean there aren't stressors inside. Um, one of the areas that we battle stress is in our heads, right in between our ears. Uh, what we fill our heads with can influence and affect the amount of stress we have in our lives. So Pastor Casey, I talked about last week that we just have so much knowledge at our disposal right now, at our fingertips, that we don't even know what to do with it. And unfortunately, we kind of dropped our filters and we kind of just, we let everything in. We let all content in. doesn't matter what ends up in our Facebook feeds, whatever we can find on YouTube, cat videos, whether it's uh, Instagram, Snapchat, social media, whatever, Netflix. We just let it all in. And that's got to have some effect on us. So God actually gives us eight tests to help us filter out the junk and to filter out the noise. Philippians 4.8 says, Fill your minds with those things that are true and good and right. Think about things that are pure and beautiful and respected. If anything is excellent or if anything is worthy of honor, think about those things. So there are eight right there. True, good, right, pure, beautiful, respected, excellent, worthy of honor. Those are your eight filters to determine what you should be watching, what you should be filling your heads with. Those are the litmus test. And it's not just for our kids. It's easy to say, well, my kids should follow that. Only watch the kids' kids programs on Netflix. But what are we watching? You know, we can't just hide behind the saying, do as I say, not as I do. Because if I'm watching something and one of my my older daughter comes over and she looks at it and I talk, oh, you can't watch that. Uh, this is daddy and mommy can watch. Um, that affects her as well. I mean, we can't just hide behind that. We are held to the standard as well. Isaiah 26.3 says, You, Lord, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed in you. So again, we're still talking about a peace that passes understanding. If we are thoughts what we think about, what we focus on, we keep that on him and trust him, that leads us to the perfect peace that we are going for. Now, we finally made it. Number five, be content with anything. Be content with anything. So we need to make some clarifications because when we hear contentment, we usually, we might have a misconception about it. For some of us, we think, uh, well, let me say what contentment is not. Contentment is not laziness, apathy, complacency, fatalism, or lack of ambition. And we definitely know Paul was content, and we know that Paul was not lacking in ambition. He was one of the most ambitious men to try and bring the good news and to share the gospel around the world. So let me tell you what contentment is. Contentment is enjoying what I have now rather than waiting for something else to happen in order for me to be happy. So if you had the choice between happiness now and maybe happiness later, and those two levels of happiness are comparable. It's not like you just get either a little bit of happiness and you're taking the risk to get more happiness. This isn't a test of delayed gratification. Is happy now or maybe happy later. You go for the happy now. Philippians 4, verses 11 to 12, it says, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of contentment in every situation, whether I am well fed or hungry, when I have more than I need, or when I don't have enough. So we see from Paul that even in the bad times, he was still content. He's showing us that contentment is independent of your circumstances. You could be going through a rough patch. You could have failed a test. You could have 
broken up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You could have been fired from your job, yet you can still be content. And also from Paul, and he says it twice, is that he learned to be content. He learned the secret of contentment. So contentment is learned. Kind of like worry, it's not something you were born with. And there are three ways that we can learn contentment. If you follow on in your, in your handouts, the first is to stop comparing. Stop comparing. So you don't need to keep up with the Joneses because jealousy is like a cancer. It is malignant. It will spread. It will eat your joy. It's a joy eater. One of my girls can be happy playing one toy. My other girl happy playing another toy. And they're fine. But the moment one of them sees the other, she will get up, walk over, and try to take that toy or play with the toy, and they will get into a fight. And parents, you know what I'm talking about. If they were in separate rooms and they were playing with the toy, they would have been happy. But as soon as they see someone with something else, game over. Another example. So my wife and I, we hug. Uh, kids, yes, your parents do hug, whether you see it or not. You know, it's, it's not just for boyfriends and girlfriends on high school campuses. Husbands and wives do hug. And with our first daughter, if Amy and I were hugging, she'd be all happy. She'd run over. She'd squeeze in between us like an Oreo, and, and we'd make an Evelyn sandwich. And she still does that. But our second daughter... And so she walks now. As soon as she sees us hugging, and it's been happening lately, especially these last few days, last few weeks, she'll start crying. And she'll be like, she wants to be hugged. And we don't know if she's jealous of me or jealous of Amy or just both of us. We don't know, but we we could see that she's not happy with it, Um, that there is that jealousy she is comparing. Very, very different personalities. Don't be like that. Number two is stop thinking that having more is better. Stop thinking that having more is better. Ecclesiastes 4, 6. It says, it is better to have only a little with peace of mind than to be busy all the time with both hands trying to catch the wind. So do something for me. If you have your phones, especially for those actually using your phones right now, uh, Put it in the pocket in front of you. Put it on your side. Put it on your lap. Just, just close it. Uh, a little demonstration for me. So what do you put your security in? Is it your house? Is it your car, your bank account, your portfolio? I got some bad news. Is You can lose that. You can lose all of that. You can lose your job. And you don't take them with you when you die. So my question to you is, do you own your possessions? Or do your possessions own you? I mean, your phone out of your hands, did any of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but did you feel like your phone was calling out to you saying, check me, check me? Do you have any notifications? Do you need to text your friend? Do you have have another Facebook message? Do you need to chat with the person right next to you over your phone? Some of you do that in here. Um. Yeah, I know. I sit in the back, so I see everything. I can be guilty of that too sometimes. So keep, keep yourself in check. Number three is learn to admire without having to acquire. So back in my day is Christians all had to snowboard. It was just a thing. If you're a Christian, you snowboard. And I'd snowboard with my friends who go up to Mountain High, and every time I would rent a snowboard because I didn't own one. And in college, we were going on a, we're going to a retreat at Mammoth, and I thought now is the time for me to buy my own snowboard. So I went on eBay, bought a used one, a used one, at least that was a good idea. And I thought I have enough time for it to ship. And I paid for it, and the shipper took his sweet time. It just days and days, and he just didn't ship it. Finally, he shipped it, and I saw when it was to arrive. It was to arrive the same day I was leaving for Mammoth. In other words, I leave in the morning, and it arrives in the afternoon. And so I still had to rent a board 
And that was the last time I snowboarded. So I had a board and bindings in my closet, in my garage for over 10 years, and I never used it. That's such, and eventually I had to get rid of it. It was such a waste. Sometimes it's okay, it's okay to rent. You don't have to own everything. It's okay to rent. So God gave us five ways on your handouts, ways to reduce our stress. And if you feel like these are too hard, that you don't, just don't have the willpower to do so, well, the last verse, verse 13, is some good news for you. Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul was not a superman. He didn't do things on his own. He did it and he knew it because God gave him the strength to do so. You don't have to go through your stressful times by yourself. Give them to God. Unload them onto God. Let them be his burden. You can choose to have Christ right there with you to be a shield about you and to give you a perfect peace that passes understanding. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Pastor Casey. Well, thank you, Peter, for that message. And what I want us to do is like, right now, actually, I want to invite the worship team to come up for a time of response. And in this response time, I want you to think about this, about the five things that the elder Peter talked about, about refusing to worry, about talking to God about everything, about thanking God in all things, and and thinking about good things, and being content with anything. Which one do you struggle with the most? I want you to think about that. Which one do you struggle with the most? And and circle that. And in your prayer, ask God to help you to overcome in that area of life. So right now, um, let's get ready for um, a time of response. Respond to God in, in your prayer. And also in in your worship and also in your giving. So as they lead, would, would we all stand? And would the ushers please come forth? Let's just meditate the identity that we have in Christ. I am a child of God. Father, we come before you. We offer to you our hearts, offer to you our worship, offer to you our finance. Because we want to be like you, God. God, you are a giver. You're not a taker, you're a giver. You gave us your son, the greatest gift of all, so that we can be saved so that we can be redeemed. So teach us to be more like you, God, this morning. Help us to rely on you, to pray about everything, to think about things that are of you, 
and to be content with whatever you give us, God. For those of us who are worried, for those of us who are stressed, I pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding to come upon them right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. May we receive the benediction and may the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us today and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Be sure to greet one another before you leave today. And we do have DTS at 1115. And if you could exit this door and we'll have some refreshments outside.